Yeah, no, that, I'm happy.
Well, thank you all and welcome uh, to this forum. I'm Dan Glickman, director of the IOP, and we want to welcome our guest today, Senator Chuck Schumer from New York. Now, many words have been written and have used to describe today's speaker. Words like shy, uncertain, <laughs> quiet, passive. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the wrong introduction, you know. <laughs> today I have the right paper. Many words have been used to describe him more accurately. Tenacious, unflinching, tireless, passionate, and tough. And believe me, knowing him for many years, they are all accurate. Over his political career, he's tackled issues as broad-ranging as the Empire State he represents. How many of you in this room are from the state of New York, by the way? All right, okay. He has been a pioneer in the fight against crime, an advocate for women's rights, a leader in the fight against AIDS, a staunch ally of Israel, an aggressive foe of white-collar crime, and a champion of better fuel efficiency for our vehicles. As a legislator, he wrote the Brady Bill, co-wrote the legislation to ban assault weapons, and authored the Omnibus Crime Bill, which put 100,000 police officers on the street. He was the sponsor of the Landmark Violence Against Women's Act, which was the first federal legislation to protect women against domestic violence. And more recently, he helped create the Victims' Compensation Fund, helping families of those that lost their lives on 9-11 and prevailed to find the money for those relief efforts. Tonight, he is going to discuss the battle over the judiciary and his role in evaluating the Bush administration on its nominations to the federal judiciary. In fact, he has been so effective in filibustering certain conservative nominees that his opponents have invented a new word to describe him and his tactics, Schumerism. His efforts have earned him the wrath of the conservative editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, which said, and I quote, Schumerism has wrought incalculable damage to our political fabric. For two years, Senator Schumer has waged a campaign to subvert the criteria by which the Senate ratifies presidential judicial picks. The editorial continues, judges whose views on affirmative action and abortion are outside the mainstream should be disqualified from sitting on the federal bench regardless of competence. As for the definition of mainstream, Schumerism simply holds that conservatives are ipso facto extremist. I'm sure that Senator Schumer will have some thoughts about that editorial page. He was first elected to the State Assembly in, in, in New York in 74, elected to the U.S. House in 1980, where he served with Congressman Mazzoli and I on the House Judiciary Committee, and elected to the Senate in 1988. He is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. And uh, we have had several candidates for president here uh, who have all been to Yale. And so we were asked to bring a Harvard person in to speak. But you're not running for president yet, but we're glad to have you here. Let me just mention one other thing. This wonderful brochure that the students prepared. There is a, there is a slight misprint in the brochure. If, if you look at the uh, last paragraph where it describes him, and his birthday is November 23rd, which is, mine's the 24th, so we're Sagittarians. Uh, but if you look at the end, it says in 1998, unfortunately, Schumer became New York's junior senator. <laughs> the unfortunately was supposed to be that he is a Yankees fan. And uh, so I think he'll remember for the rest of his life this, this mistake. We want him to know that people are not upset here at Harvard that he was elected to the United States Senate. Let's welcome Senator Chuck Schumer from New York. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you. It is uh, great to be here. I want to thank the uh, Institute of Politics for sponsoring this wonderful afternoon. As somebody who is a uh, graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, it's just great to be back. And what I thought I'd do is I'd tell you two little stories, um, because they're relevant here, about how I got involved in politics. And second, uh, just a little bit about the times that I was an undergraduate and how it influenced me which may be interesting to you, and then we'll talk about the judges and have time for questions. I was raised, and, and I will acknowledge, I hope I don't embarrass her, my daughter, who is a sophomore here in Mather House at Harvard, and uh, I think she's having a great time. Um, anyway, uh, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, went to local public schools, and uh, PS 197, Cunningham, and Madison. 
From Madison, I was lucky enough to get into Harvard. In those days, very few from Madison went to Harvard. The student body composition was considerably different than it is today. It was largely people from, I think, 60 percent went to private schools, and the rest were, the majority were from well-to-do suburban school districts. And um, I got into Harvard for two reasons. I was a decent, although not great, basketball player. Our team's motto in high school was, we may be small, but we're slow. <laughs> and second, I had to get a job when I was 14. There was a Madison High School teacher who had started a new business a few blocks from my home. And he, uh, they, were, they had a job to run, most of you were too young to remember, but there was a day before Xerox machines. They had these things called Mimeo machines, and you'd have to make a stencil and put it on a machine, and it would go around and around. A fancy one was electric, which we had, and went around and around. Anyway, the, the um, business that was being started by this Madison High School teacher, he had this new idea. He said that he could prepare students for the SATs. His name was Stanley Kaplan, and he sold the business to the Washington Post 25 years later for a large sum of money. But I worked there for three years. And as the machine went around and around and around, I'd read the preparatory materials over and over <laughs> again, and I got 800s on my tests. <laughs> so I got into Harvard, and I was scared. I said, how am I a kid from Brooklyn going to make it? I go to the one fella from my high school who had gone to Harvard before me, and I said to him, Red, how am I going to make it at this place? He says, it's easy. Try out for the basketball team. They're terrible. <laughs> you'll make it, and you'll have friends. So it was about the first week of school, and they had tryouts for the freshman team. It was over at something, I don't know if they still call it that, the IAB. They didn't have all that gym complex across the river, so this was called the Indoor Athletic Building. And uh, we were wearing these little numbers for the tryouts. And the coach says, number 27, yes, sir, you're Schumer. Yes, sir. You played for Madison. Yes, sir. Said, how's coach so-and-so? He's fine, sir. And then he looks quizzically at me. He said, you played forward? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, how tall are you? I said, I'm six foot one, sir. He said, can you dribble? I said, not very well, sir. <laughs> he said, go home. I was distraught. I wrote my parents a note saying, told you I should have gone to Brooklyn College. I'm a flop here already. And that night, someone knocks on my door and says, how would you like to join the Harvard Young Democrats? We are working for a man named Eugene McCarthy, who is going to run against Lyndon Johnson in the New Hampshire primary to challenge Johnson's uh, view that we should be in the v go into Vietnam. And I said, sure. I didn't have a political bone in my body. Had somebody knocked on my door and said, how, did you, how would you like to join the Harvard Seashell Collecting Club? I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but I got bitten by the bug, spent a lot of time in New Hampshire working for Eugene McCarthy. In fact, in the early days, I was the deputy campaign manager for the town of Berlin, which is a paper mill town way up north. Only I would get go six hours up on the bus. And every few weeks, I'd be demoted from deputy campaign manager, this, this. Finally, the campaign I knew was gr gaining ground when I became what I should have been, which was a messenger, because all these new people who knew what to do uh, came in. But I got bitten by the bug, and I love politics. And then I ran for the assembly right out of law school and was elected. Um, I won't tell you that story, because we have a lot else to do. But I did want to tell you one other thing. My politics may be a little different than you think. I am. I, I mean, I guess I'm a liberal, I'm a progressive, but a moderate liberal progressive, but I really despise ideologues, far left or far right. And it helps inform my passion about preventing the hard right ideologues from taking over the bench, and I'll get to that in a minute. But that came about from being here in Harvard in the late 60s, because there was a very strong anti-war movement, which I was part of. But I always believe that we should be working through the system. I said, it's a democracy. You have to convince other people, hard as that might be, to your point of view. We had some idols in those days, one of them was sitting here. 
because every so often an anti-war person was elected to Congress from a place you'd never expect. David Obie from northern Wisconsin, I remember we had a big celebration when he won. And when Ron Mazzoli, who is sitting here and now at the Institute of Politics, won from Louisville, Kentucky, I was in law school and it was a time for celebration. Um, but m I was excoriated. There were a few of us, including a professor here at the Kennedy School, Steve Kelman. I don't know if he's here. Um, he's still in school. Because we didn't like the, the, the radicals had taken over. And they really believed that they were so right that they had the message from God that they could be mean, nasty, intolerant of any other point of view. That because they thought they were morally righter than anyone else, they could take over a building or even some at the most extreme engage in violence. And they were nasty. They'd go over to policemen and say, pig, and I would say to them, that man's just trying to earn a living and feed his family. What gives you the right to go over and be so cruel to him? He's doing his job as he sees best. You may want to try to explain to him why he shouldn't be a policeman. You could try to do that. But so I really thought I witnessed what Alexander Hamilton described in the, found, in the Federalist Papers as a mobocracy. There was no tolerance. There was no real dispute of views. Whoever said the most militant thing had the highest moral ground, and it made me really dislike ideologues of any type. And it really does inform much of what I do politically and does with the judges. So now let me talk about the battle over the judges. Um, I, you know, when you're a senator, particularly one on the Judiciary Committee, you have some involvement, some considerable involvement, in choosing judges in your own state. And I've had three criteria as I've chosen judges. They are excellence. A judge, a federal judge, should be legally excellent. He should have a good or she should have a good education. They should have good experience. This should not be this, the job of enormous power, lifetime appointment, Political hacks, someone's brother-in-law should not be put on the bench. The second is ideology. I believe that judges should be moderate. I don't like them too far right, and I don't like them too far left. For the very reason that the founding fathers, and the more I'm around, the more their wisdom makes my hair stand on edge. I'm so awed by it. And they wanted judges to interpret the law. They realized that the Article III branch of government is the one non-elected branch of government. They wanted the making of law to go to the two elected branches of government. And they wanted judges to interpret the law. Well, when someone is an ideologue, whether it be far right, far left, they feel so passionately about what they believe in that they don't want to make law. They don't want to interpret law. They want to make law. That's bad. And the third standard I have in helping choose judges is diversity. I don't think the bench should be only white males. Now, quite frankly, George Bush has been quite good on numbers one and number three as he appoints the judges. In other words, most of his appointees have been legally excellent. They are bright, they are accomplished, they are thoughtful, and he certainly met gone beyond everyone's expectations in di on diversity. He has appointed or nominated a large number of people of color, women, to the bench. It's on ideology that he's an abject failure. No president in American history has nominated judges through an ideological prism as much as George Bush. If you had to choose judges on a 1 to 10 scale, with 10 being the most liberal, 1 being the most conservative, 5 being right down the middle, Bill Clinton, frankly, nominated a lot of 5s, 6s, 7s, some 8s. Very few ACLU lawyers or legal aid attorneys, far more prosecutors, partners in law firms. Well. George Bush has nominated a huge number of ones and twos and maybe a sprinkling of threes. 
And how did this happen? Well, here's my view. I don't have proof of it, but I'll share it with you. I believe that the hard, hard right, I don't mean mainstream conservatism, but I mean the hard, hard right. These are people who, in my view, their philosophy at its core is greed. They're sort of personified by maybe when Tom DeLay goes home to his country club in the suburbs of Houston and self-made businessmen come over to him and say, I built my own business. How dare the government tell me I can't pollute the air? I built my own business. How dare the government tell me I have to pay a certain wage to somebody or have working conditions that way? There's greed. That's what it's the core of it. I'm a self-made person. I should do what I want. And that philosophy, which initially I think was just pure greed, over the years by the think tanks and the editorial pages like the Wall Street Journals, has sort of had a philosophical patina placed over it that greed is really what's good, as Gordon Gekko said in that movie some 10 years ago, that by letting business people do just what they want, that will do the best for all of us. It's not even a libertarian philosophy, frankly. Well, these folks came to the conclusion, the hard right, that they couldn't bring America to their viewpoint, even when they captured the two other branches of government, the elected branches. They had the presidency, the Article II branch under Ronald Reagan, to a lesser extent under George Bush I. They had the Congress when Newt Gingrich was uh, predominant in 94 and 95, 95 and 96. But much to their chagrin, they found that no matter, even when they had politicians who expressed fealty to these ideas, they couldn't get it done. And that's simply, simply it's sort of obvious why, because most American politics is decided in the middle and they weren't going to get it done. So they came up in the late 90s with a brilliant theory. They said, we can accomplish our goal, which fundamentally is a hatred of the federal government, that any time the federal government moves, chop its fingers off, because it's the federal government that's getting in the way of all these things that they don't like, if we could capture the one non-elected branch of the government, the Article III branch, the judiciary. And I'm not a conspiratorialist, but I do believe there was a deal, explicit or implicit, with George Bush, Karl Rove, or whomever. And they basically said, we'll leave you alone in the, 90, in the 2000 campaign. We won't hound you the way, say, they did Bob Dole in 96, that you're not enough pro-life or not enough pro-gun or not enough this or that, provided if you should win the presidency that you give us control over appointments to the judiciary. Bush sort of gave a signal that he was going to do that to his credit. It wasn't, we weren't caught totally unawares. He said in the campaign a few times that he intends to appoint judges in the mold of Scalia and Thomas, the two very conservative judges on the Supreme Court. Then he won, and sure enough, the people who were appointed as part of the process of choosing judges had huge numbers of people from the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society, as many of you know, is sort of Justice Scalia's sort of lawyer troops who have this view that the federal government is bad, evil. And they began to nominate judges from the hard, hard right. Well, I realized this, and I've been senator for five years. I'm in my first term. And probably the most important thing I've written as a senator was an op-ed piece in the New York Times where I wrote that it was not only our right as senators, but our obligation to question the judges when they came before us after the president nominated them on their judicial philosophy, on their ideology. That it was perfectly legitimate and appropriate to ask a judge a question, what's your view of the First Amendment and how expansive it ought to be and how might you interpret Buckley v. Vallejo? What's your view on the right to privacy and a woman's right to choose? What's your view on the Commerce Clause and how expansively it ought to be interpreted? And I pointed out 
And I'm going to mention this because uh, Alex Sanders is, was here. I don't know if he still is from South Carolina because he mentioned he lived in John Rutledge's house. Well, we, when you look at history, this was clearly something that the Founding Fathers envisioned. What they envisioned was an active Senate questioning judges on their views. One of the first people nominated to the Supreme Court was John Rutledge of South Carolina. And the Senate rejected him. I think he was right, Alec, the first Senate rejection of a nominee by President Washington. And they rejected him on, of all things, his views on the Jay Treaty. Jay Treaty had something to do with Britain, France, and the relationship with America. And in that Senate, I think it was of 24 people, there were a handful of founding fathers. So they knew, and they thought this was legit. But when I wrote that we ought to start doing this, we stopped doing this for a longer period of time, starting, I guess, in the 50s, maybe a little earlier. Not only was I excoriated by the hard right, Dan mentioned some of the Wall Street Journal editorial pages' fulminations, but also by the mainstream legal bar. Lloyd Cutler, Democratic counsel to, I think it was, uh, Jimmy Carter, said, this is absurd. Judges don't make law, they interpret it. And we shouldn't be asking them these questions because they will look at the law and determine what is right. Well, that kind of logic, first, to me, is just wrong. And Cass Sunstein, a brilliant professor at the University of Chicago, did a study where he showed that judges who were appointed by Democrats ruled differently on whole varieties of cases, siding with the corporation versus siding with the labor union, siding with the environmentalists, siding with those against them, siding with you know, right, the civil rights and women's rights. And there was a huge disparity between those who were nominated by Democratic presidents and those who were nominated by Republican presidents. And of course that's true. Every judge tries to interpret the law, but his or her values, their way of thinking, infuse how they come out. And we know that. And it was even known in the Senate. But people were afraid to talk about it. I mean, so what Democrats would do when they didn't like a Republican nominee is instead of asking him, his views, they'd say, oh, he smoked marijuana when he was in college. And then if Republicans didn't like a Democrat's view, they'd say, oh, he took out the wrong movie from the video shop 10 years ago. And that was a demeaning process. And it was a kabuki-like process, because only the Democrats were mad when a Republican smoked marijuana, and only the Republicans were mad when a Democrat smoked marijuana. It was not a standard. Anyway, I wrote this, and at first it was sort of the legal community went, oh, and the hard right started attacking me, but I kept at it. I even debated this issue against Judge Wilkerson, one of the leading members of the conservative members of the judiciary mentioned as a possible nominee to the Supreme Court before three or four Supreme Court justices at a forum. And after about a year, I sort of won. Even the Heritage Foundation, one of the conservative think tanks, came out and said, Schumer's right. These questions are legitimate, even though we don't agree with where he'd come down on them. They are legitimate questions to ask. And so then, the, once that became established, the Republicans began a different theory, the Bush administration. They had to, now what are we going to do? They started telling nominees, certainly one, their prize nominee, Miguel Estrada, don't answer the questions. And so when we asked him, what is your view of the First Amendment and how to interpret it, he said, oh, I can't answer that. It might prejudge how I would rule on a case once I became a judge. And that would violate Canon 5 of the lawyer's ethics. That was hooey. Of course, you can't talk about a specific case. And if we were to ask Miguel Estrada, if we had asked Miguel Estrada, what's your view on how Enron ought to be treated? He should say no. But if you ask him, what's his view on corporate ethics? Of course he should answer it. And most of the sitting Supreme Court justices have answered questions like that, if not before Senate committees, in articles, as professors, as judges themselves. 
But Estrada refused to answer the questions, and I went to our Democratic caucus, and I got up and I said, we have to block this nomination by the only means we have, which is to filibuster it. I said, don't do it because you think we'll win politically. We won't. They will call us names, anti-Hispanic. They will say, let a majority rule. But I said, do it for two reasons. First, because if Miguel Estrada were to have gotten on the Court of Appeals, D.C. Court of Appeals, he would change it dramatically. And secondly, they would probably nominate him for the U.S. Supreme Court when the first vacancy occurred, and he'd change that even more dramatically. We don't know his exact views because he was never a judge and he was never a professor who wrote articles, but people who knew him said he was far to the right of Scalia. Brilliant, but far to the right of Scalia and would have shifted the court for a generation. He's in his young 40s. But I said there's a more important reason to do this, and that is to uphold the Constitution because the Founding Fathers expected the Senate to truly advise and consent and not be a rubber stamp. And I spent hours with each senator trying to persuade each of them. And sure enough, we blocked Miguel Estrada. It was easier for me from a state like New York to do it, I'll tell you, than Democratic senators from states like Arkansas and Montana. And they showed and continue to show amazing courage as they stand up for the Constitution and for the next generation of Americans. Because if they capture the bench the way they want to, again, as I said, most of their nominees are very young and will be making law for your, your college students, children, and even grandchildren. Well, we blocked Estrada, and now we've blocked three more. And there's a handful of others we will block. Can we block every one? No. We don't have the ability to do that politically, and it's probably the wrong thing to do. But we are choosing those who are a combination of totally out of the mainstream and on significant benches. We haven't blocked any district court judges um, because they make law much less than court of appeals judges. And even I voted for some that I totally disagree with. I voted for Jay Bybee on the Ninth Circuit. He's, he is an extreme judge. But the Ninth Circuit's very liberal. So to have a conservative there doesn't bother me because the balance doesn't have to be each individual. You don't need every person to be moderate, but you need the courts to come out that way. In fact, to me, the ideal Supreme Court will have one Scalia and one Brennan, but not five of either because that'll be a court that will make law, not interpret the law. Anyway, when we started doing this politically, it wasn't popular. But it sort of rolled in our direction. First, people began to realize that the president was not just nominating highly qualified people, but he was nominating people hard right. And second, as we kept at it, it began, the word began to get out. You have your little sign? This is Jeff Berman, my counsel, who happens to be in Boston today. We're letting people know of 160, we have approved 168 judges and blocked four. So when they call us obstructionists, there's only one logical conclusion to reach, that the only way not to be obstructionist in the eyes of President Bush and the eyes of all of those who feel this is to approve every single one of his judges. And that is firmly against what the Founding Fathers wanted. They did not want a rubber stamp. They wanted an active Senate. Now, I have voted against more than that. I voted probably, I think, against 11 as of now. But it's still 158 out of 11, but they're carefully chosen. And as I said, we've begun to pick up steam as people realize we're not being obstructionist, but just keeping, trying to keep a small degree of moderation on the bench. And we will continue to do it. We're having greater success rather than less success despite the attacks. And probably, most importantly, the President knows now that when the vacancy, the first vacancy occurs on the Supreme Court in his term, if it does, that if he nominates someone who is way over 
who is out of the mainstream and on the hard right, he should expect the fight of his life. Thank you. Uh, great remarks. I think the senator is obviously very comfortable in answering questions. If you would try to just keep your questions as uh, to the point as possible. And we'll start here, and then we've got some mics up there as well. But we'll go these two first, and then we'll go up to the top. So you might state where you, where you are, where you go to school, what your name is, that kind of thing. Uh, senator Schumer, my name is Josh Potashnik. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, as you alluded to, next time there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, there's going to be quite a nomination fight. Um, I know when President Clinton submitted, uh, nominated his two Supreme Court justices, he collaborated with uh, Republicans on the Judiciary Committee to try to find a nominee they would find mutually acceptable. Has there been any talk of attempting to do that with the Bush administration, and have they uh, seemed receptive at all to this? Well, Mr. Potashnik, that's a great question, and that is one of the fundamental problems that the President has had. The Constitution said that the President should nominate and the Senate should, give ad should advise and consent. And if you read the Federalist Papers, first they wanted an active Senate. In fact, for much of the Constitutional <laughs> Convention, they wanted the Senate to nominate the judges. They thought giving the President the ability to do it would give him too much power. But then they realized that the Senate, even then, which would only have had 26 senators, was too diffuse a body to nominate somebody. But they certainly wanted an active Senate. And the advise word meant just what you're saying. They envisioned the president sitting down with the Senate or the leaders of the Senate and saying, who can we sort of agree on? And frankly, I think with the Republican president and Republican Senate, we would not insist that it has to be a liberal Democrat or have any particular view on any particular issue. But it should be someone above all who would interpret the law, not make the law. There has been absolutely no consultation on the Supreme Court, none on the DC Court of Appeals, and very little on most of the other courts. But when they do come and ask for us to advise and consent, we can do it. Now, here I am. I'm one of the two or three leading proponents of this um, idea in the Senate. And yet, when it comes to New York, we've sat down with the White House and we filled every vacancy. And they meet every one of the nominees, the ones I've made and the ones they've made, and they've made more than I have, meet the three standards, at least, that I have, or the group of them meets the standards. Every one of them meets the standards of excellence and moderation, and the group meets the standards of diversity. But they have done virtually none of it for the very reason, in my judgment, that the only people they want on the Supreme Court are hard right. Now, there was a little rumor, this is a little tangential, but you might find it interesting, that the White House was very eager that Judge Rehnquist, Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist, did not resign as he was thinking of after the June term, because that would put them in a total box, because the hard right was expecting a nominee who was hard right and yet they knew that the American people didn't want such a nominee and, frankly, that the Senate would not approve. So that they were glad they breathed a real sigh of relief when Justice Rehnquist did not resign. I would hope and pray they could come together and, 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 and talk to us and we could come up with a choice, again, that I wouldn't agree with philosophically, but at least it would be a thoughtful and interpretive person. And this happens. I mean, just one example. Justice Kennedy is very conservative and was never known as taking breathtaking decisions in any place until this year. And he wrote the Kennedy decision, which for, you know, gay and lesbian people is going to be as probably as revolutionary as Brown v. Board was for African Americans. And it's only the lifetime appointment that let him do that. Um, it's an amazing decision, and it's an amazing tribute, that decision, to the Founding Fathers. You wouldn't think that Justice Kennedy would come out with this decision, because he could have been very narrow in the way he did it, and he didn't. He made it broad and breathtaking and brought the court with him. So 
doesn't have to be somebody who agrees with you, but it does have to be somebody who you think will interpret law, will be thoughtful enough, not an ideologue, that they just have this narrow view and never change. And that's what we would insist on, but it's unlikely he will come to us. He hasn't. Uh, Senator, where does this end? I know the Republicans did it to you guys under Clinton. You do it to Bush under um, now. What, what does this mean for the long-term uh, well, nature of the process? Well, the bottom line is very simple, and that is that it is true that, well, if you ask Orrin Hatch, he says, we never filibustered a judge. That's true, because when Clinton nominated people and the Republicans had control of the Senate, um, they didn't bring up for any votes in the committee or other over 50 judges, and that's why there are so many vacancies, so that George Bush, despite all this sturm and drang, you say, when is it going to end? Well, we've appointed 168 judges. The only people who feel the process are broken is saying, we want to have every one of his nominees approved. So I don't think when is it going to end is appropriate, at least the way I feel. But it will end when President Bush says just what the gentleman before said, that he'll sit down and do what previous presidents, including Bill Clinton, has done, and that is sit down with the Senate and say, let's come to some kind of understanding and agreement as to who I will nominate. He hasn't even tried. I will say this, at least for me, and I think it's true of most of my Democratic colleagues, this is not tit for tat. If it was tit for tat, we'd hold up 50 of them. It is much rather a feeling, that, at least that I have, that ideologues, by and large, do not belong on the bench, and that to demean the process as they have tried, particularly you know, with the strategy of don't answer any questions, is very important. Uh, it's important to keep the process. I'm very grateful for this work you're doing, Senator, but um, I would appreciate it if you would help me understand what you, more precisely what you mean by uh, the hard right than saying that they are people who hate the federal government. I think there are more specific details you might help us with. Well, you know, there's not one view. I mean, how do I make a decision on whether to support or oppose a judge? Well, on that, it's, you cannot write out a formula. It's rather someone after you read their history, read their writings, and then we take the nomination process when they come before us and we question them very seriously, somebody who will interpret the law, who will follow the law as opposed to make their own law. And that could be someone on the hard left, and maybe it could be someone who's just a pure iconoclast who's in the middle. Um, but So that would be that. In terms of hard right, I think at the core of it is people who have anathema for the federal government and want to turn the clock back at least pre-New Deal. And some of them, this new judge that they nominated, who I believe we will stop, Justice Brown of the California court, you know, again, the Wall Street Journal wrote, the only reason I oppose her is because I disagree with her on affirmative action. She's against affirmative action. She's an African-American woman who opposed affirmative action on the California Supreme Court. Janice Brown? Janice Brown, yeah. But that's not the reason at all. She is clearly an ideologue, and you know she has written both in court opinions and in speeches, she has said in speeches, that she thought Lochner, a 1906 decision that was regarded as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions of the 20th century, it said New York State had passed a law that said bakery workers who lived in, who worked under terrible and heated conditions and many died um, could not work more than 60 hours a week. And in Lochner, the Supreme Court said throughout New York State's law, coming up with the theory that it interfered with the right of the individual to contract with a company. It so was it's a horrible decision. Oliver Wendell Holmes had a ringing dissent. And Justice Brown wrote that Oliver Wendell Holmes was all wet and that Lochner was decided correctly. That's way beyond Scalia, who at least said, let the states decide things, even though we don't want the federal government to decide things. So that would be my basic informed view. Um, there can be people of different, you know, it's hard to say, but these are not mainstream conservatives. 
Hi, um, my name is Jocelyn Benson. I'm a third year student at the law school and I know I speak on a lot of students' behalf when I say the progressive law students are very thankful for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank you for that, but I was intrigued by how you started your speech by talking about how, um, well, I understand you were saying you would also oppose ideologues on the left. Correct. And I was wondering if you could give an example of a judge, maybe a historical judge, who you would have opposed um, as a left-wing ideologue. Well, you know, that's a good question. And let me say, I guess I'd have to think about that. I have, I mean, I don't give the names out, but we have a committee in New York that vets judges because I get to nominate some. And as Jeff, my counsel, will tell you, I carefully question them on whether they think they should be making law by moving things over. I'll give you, I'm not going to give a name, but one judge that I eliminated was he had the idea that New York City should pay for all mental health services of um, homeless people. There was no law that said that should happen. And he came up with some kind of interpretation based on a general clause of the um, New York State Constitution. To me, that was making law. And I said, that gentleman shouldn't be a judge. But I will try to give you some names of others. Uh, I'll think about that. It's a good question. And again, I probably, I might have voted for Scalia if he was nominated to the Supreme Court on the war, in, during the Warren days. And I probably would have voted to oppose the fifth Brennan or even the third Brennan on the court. Because, again, there ought to be balance. It doesn't have to be a balance within each person, but of the court itself. That's why on the Ninth Circuit I supported Bybee, even though I thought he was way over. Jones. Yeah, my name's Corey, class of 07 in the college. Um, there are over 20,000 uh, gun control laws on the books in America, and many people thought that the Brady Act was going to be it, um, found unconstitutional for a few ways. Uh, that's the first part of my question, um, is what do you see the future of gun control laws? Will another out of the 20,000 have success that can be constitutional? And then just the second part is that there was some talk in the conservative front about the crime uh, bill and the $6.1 billion, is it, that was included in that for special programs, um, such as is, um, cops, cops yeah, on the beat. Exactly, um, and they were bringing up some psychological evidence that said that um, that positive reinforcement uh, was going to help more than those programs, and that they were looking at slashing a lot of that funding if they took control of the of Congress. They have. What's they have? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let me just say first, the Brady Law has been largely upheld. A small little part of it was declared unconstitutional on a state federal balance, but it is still on the books, and it's overwhelmingly successful. Um, if you look at all the statistics in terms of the number of gun crimes, the number of uh, murders with guns, robberies with guns, and other things, they have dramatically declined. Now, you say all crime has declined, but actually gun crime has declined at a steeper rate. Um, I forget the number now because it goes up all the time, but hundreds of thousands of felons who have walked into gun shops have been denied guns because you know they check them out, and uh, if they're a felon, they don't get it. So the Brady Law is a big success, and I think it will stay. On gun control in general, now I'm a strong advocate of gun control. Um, I, as Dan mentioned, I wrote the Brady Law, the assault weapons ban. Um, every year, the NRA has a magazine called the American Rifleman, and they put a very handsome picture of me. There aren't too many handsome pictures of me, um, but they put a very handsome picture of me on the cover except it has a bullseye on my forehead, and they say public enemy number one. Um, but I think in this, what's happened at least, we've reached a stasis in the public opinion on gun control. And that is people say the laws that are on the books should stay, but we probably shouldn't add any new laws. And part of that is because, I would disagree with that, but part of that is because crime is lower. And the cry to do something, anything, is, uh, is much less than it was 10 or 15 years ago. As for the crime bill, cop on the beat bill, which is the bulk of the funding you're talking about, putting, letting the federal government help pay not only for police officers, but to do community policing, which meant get out of the patrol cars, walk the beats, get to know the community, and be a more effective police officer, again, has been hugely successful in my opinion. 
I mean, we've made dramatic progress on crime. And this is something that I devoted a large portion of my congressional career to do. I saw the neighborhoods I represented as a congressman in Brooklyn being ripped apart by crime and the government, whether it be local, state, or federal, powerless to do anything. And I studied it and figured out what could be done. And again, it was eclectic. In other words, a lot of the things we had tougher punishment. When 85% of the criminals were recidivists, there was a simple logic you could reduce crime by increasing the sentences. <laughs> it's almost inexorable in its logic. And because 85% of the crimes are being caused by people who had gotten out of prison, if you kept them in prison longer, crime would go down. Liberals don't like to admit that, but it's true. And um, so uh, I think, again, we're going to try to keep the cop on the beat law. Um, the administration is trying to eliminate it because they hate all federal spending. I mean, you look on the war in Iraq, and they're willing to spend whatever it takes overseas and virtually no money on homeland security. Why? That's not ideologically against what they believe, but they just hate spending any kind of domestic money. They want the federal government to shrink. Yes, sir. Um, hello, Senator. My name is Tomas Kovana. I am a Shorenstein Fellow here at the Kennedy School. Um, I wonder whether you could elaborate a little bit more on your standards for um, distin distinguishing between uh, interpreting the Constitution and making laws, because yeah. sometimes the line is not quite, quite Correct. clear. Correct. And unfortunately, I can't. I wish I could. It is like Justice Stewart said about pornography. You sort of know it when you see it. And to be honest with you, you're never sure. You're never sure. And so you have to weigh a whole lot of factors. And um, in terms of the person's history and what they've done and what they've stood for, in terms of your private talk with them, because you can get almost any nominee to come in and meet with you, in terms of the hearing. And it's sort of a feel more than anything else. And we've had disagreements on our committee. The one thing I would say to you is on the Judiciary Committee of nine Democrats, ranging from very liberal to some quite conservative, if we don't have all nine, we can't sustain any filibuster. So I'd say it's a pretty high standard, even if it's an unwritten standard, and you can't specifically say. But the idea is that if the law says X, even though you firmly disagree with it, that you will follow it. The Supreme Court should change. They have the ability to change laws by interpreting the Constitution. But district court judges and even court of appeals judges are supposed to interpret law. Justice Souter was appointed to the Supreme Court on the basis that he'd probably vote more far right than he has done. And Correct. There have, other been, there have been other justices that have done that. Do you take that into account? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. And yeah, the question was Judge, Judge, when George Bush nominated Justice Souter, the, he, George Bush first, um, he thought he'd be far more conservative than he's turned out to be. He's turned to vote with the liberal bloc of four repeatedly. And I would simply say to you that you can never be 100% certain. Hugo Black was a Ku Klux Klansman and became a very liberal judge. Um, Kennedy nominated Wizard White, and I think he thought he'd be liberal. He ended up being conservative. But by and large, by and large, and there are exceptions, and the lifetime appointment is majestic, um, in terms of its giving the judge the freedom to grow and change. The judges, as Cass Sunstein's study showed, which I mentioned earlier, they pretty much stick to the way they've been. Um, but you have to take that account. And that's why just, if you have a feeling that someone has view, who was the fellow who was a pure iconoclast? McConnell. McConnell, to which circuit? Sixth? Tenth Circuit. McConnell was chosen by the president, nominated the president to the Tenth Circuit. And even though he had very conservative views, he was passed because people thought he's a thinker, he will grow on the bench, he'll do things that you might not expect. So you do take that into account. But the idea that you have no way of knowing how a judge will vote once they become a judge, that's not true. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Anderson. I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm from hi. Albany, New York. Oh, uh, excellent. The city? Or uh, uh, well, actually, Gilderland, which is just Gilderland, right. right. But, uh, I you know actually, it well. 
Before I uh, start, I just want to say belatedly thank you for getting rid of Al D'Amato. Oh, thank could. you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I had a lot of help from four, four and a half million yeah. New Yorkers. <laughs> But uh, I just wanted to talk, ask you a little bit about uh, the whole anti-Hispanic, anti-Catholic yes. controversy. How do yes. you think that'll play out if uh, a Supreme Court vacancy comes up and okay. uh, perhaps a Hispanic judge is nominated? Right. In such, in sense, Hispanics are seen as such a crucial swing voter. Swing voter. Good question. In the upcoming election, how do you see that playing? Well, out? the thing I object to almost most about those who have opposed what they're we're doing. Look, there's a good argument, not against what I have said to you. But they don't make that. Most of our opponents on this, being sort of ideologues, being sort of hard right, they do below the belt arguments. So, so far I am anti-Hispanic, because I wouldn't go along with Estrada, even though I went along with five other, I supported five other Hispanic judges. I am anti-Catholic because I've opposed um, the Attorney General who's Catholic. I didn't even know it till they called us anti-Catholic. Now, in all fairness, they called Pat Leahy and uh, the senator from Massachusetts, Ted Kennedy, anti-Catholic too, which was sort of strange. Um, I'm now anti-black, part of a lynch mob, according to Thomas Sowell, because I'm opposing Justice uh, Brown, and anti-Southern Baptist because I oppose Judge Pickering. In every one of these cases, the majority of people in that category I've supported. And the reason I've opposed these judges, in fact, I think I'm being sort of ethnically, racially, religiously colorblind, uh, blind, because I'm opposing them on their views and the standard of making rather than interpreting the law. But that's what they do. And then they've done some, so, and then of course, you know, the obstructionist charge which if you ask average people, particularly those who listen to right-wing radio, they will tell you, oh, the Democrats, they wouldn't let President Bush appoint hardly a judge. And, you know, I'd go to parades in upstate New York, Republican areas, and people would holler, why are you holding up the president's judges? And I say, I voted for 148 out of 159. They go, oh, okay. Almost like, you know, Emily Latella on Saturday Night Live, if you remember her, she'd give this thing go, never mind. But they never say that. In all of the Wall Street Journal editorials, which are legion, you know, and they're at the lead in this, not once do they mention the number of judges we've opposed. So you're right. They will try, with a, if they nominate a Hispanic to the Supreme Court, and I sincerely believe Estrada was their choice. They had hoped that we would have supported Estrada to the D.C. Court of Appeals. He'd pass 80-20, 85-15, and a year later they could nominate him for the Supreme Court. And you'd say, hey, you just voted 85, or you just voted for him, and he gets right on there. Um, so they'll use these charges, but so far they haven't stopped anybody. Can I, uh, I'm going to ask one final question, sure. if I might. Great. It's unrelated to the judges thing, but since you're here, and since you're not shy to give your perspectives on the world, uh, I want you, if you talk a little bit about the war in Iraq and where you see this going vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, we have the approval of the 85, $87 billion, but uh, okay. in terms of where, where we think this next year is going to be and, and how we can provide the appropriate oversight to make sure that, okay. that the American people are well represented in the process. Okay. Well, okay, good question. I'm going to take a step back. I'll give you my little view of where, of this post 9-11 world, and it informs what we ought to do in Iraq, and where the president's right and where he's wrong, and a good number of you will disagree with me here. Um, first, I think that, um, I would say our post 9-11 world can be described in a single sentence, and that is this, that the very technology which has blessed our lives, accounted for so much of the prosperity we've seen in the last two decades, has an evil underside. And that is that small groups of bad people can get hold of that technology and do terrible damage here in our homeland. It's going to take about five minutes. Um, it's a complicated question, and I don't just want to give you a quick answer. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, how do you know that? Well, you can be in a cave in Afghanistan and if you have a wireless connection to the internet, 
you can learn as much about America as any of us know. That's brand new. The sad fact of the matter is, if the 200 of us here this afternoon were all at once bitten by an evil virus, and we were to then decide for the next five years we would fanatically devote ourselves to um, figuring out a way to do real damage in America and then implement it, the odds are too high we could succeed. That's the world we live in. It's not a world that's a two or three year world. Even if God willing there's no more Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden and no more Saddam and Ba'ath Party in Iraq, there are going to be new groups that learn this. They're just beginning to. Al-Qaeda was the first. It could be Chechnyans. It could be East Timorese. It could be skinheads in Montana. And so this is a new world in which we live. And it's, we're right at the beginning of it. And the one thing I would say to you all, and this again goes back to my late 60s a little bit, the only people who I think are way off base in this are people who are sure they have the answer. It's brand new. We don't quite know what to do. And it's going to be with us for a while, and we're going to make mistakes. Having said that, I think that because of these new changes, we have to have a new foreign policy in America. And it has to be guided by two words together, which don't lay well with one another. The two words are proactive and multilateral. We need a policy that is both proactive and multilateral. It's hard to do both. Let me talk about each for a minute. Proactive. The U.S. foreign policy overall, over our last 200 years, has been reactive. We ignore the rest of the world, Pearl Harbor occurs, and then we mix in. You can't be reactive anymore for one simple reason. Because of this technology, you can't wait till some small group of people smuggles a nuclear weapon into the United States and blows up Chicago. Our whole world would change. And the theory of deterrence no longer works. You know, during the Cold War, we had this theory that all of the, all of the you know, people laughed at, called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. And it basically was, hey, we're going to be so strong that even if you hit us first, we'll hit you back so hard you'll never hit us to begin with. It worked, actually, when you look back in history. But it doesn't work anymore because it's small groups. Bin Laden's still around. Saddam is still around. So we have to be proactive. And frankly, I disagree with those in my party who say we should never be proactive. Or a theory of that is just be nice and everything will work out OK. I don't buy it. I frankly you know, don't think Howard Dean can win the presidency. He can disagree with George Bush, and that's good and fine, and he should. But unless he says what he would do in answer to 9-11, not just criticize George Bush. At the same time, the policy has to be multilateral. You have to engage all the nations of the world in this, or as many as you can. You can't win the war on terrorism alone, again, because of its fundamental nature. If it's small groups of people, if 500 fanatical, dedicated people can do real damage, well, we alone cannot find every one of those groups of 500. You need the 182 nations of the world, ideally, to be together in not letting them exist within their borders and not letting them send money or weapons across borders, etc. And as much as I disagree with those on the left who say never be proactive, I'm even more worried about the Cheneys and Rumsfelds of the world who say, we can do this alone. It's sort of a macho view that doesn't fit the new realities. In fact, the two people I admire most foreign policy-wise are Colin Powell and Tony Blair, both of whom I think get it and struggle with the difficulty of the 
policies, not the simplistic policies, but the more difficult and nuanced policy of being proactive and multilateral. Well, what does that mean for Iraq? Unlike most of you, I'm not so sure, even today, with all the wrong things they did, that it would have been better to do nothing. I'm not so sure that's right. But they should have done it in a multilateral way. Instead of going in ourselves, we should have waited. We could have brought the Russians along easily. Putin, I met with Putin. I don't know if you saw this. This picture got all over the place. I want to decrease our dependence on Middle East oil. And so Russia decided they, Luke Oil was going to start selling gasoline, and we opened up a gasoline station together, Putin and I. And I got to talk to him, but it shows you how bad the news media is. What did they focus on? Not the oil, which was the purpose, and not my other discussion with him, but as we went into the little 7-Eleven that was part of the Luke Oil station, he said, what's this? I said, oh, that's a Krispy Kreme donut. He had three of them. <laughs> And he said to his aide, better than Dubrovny or whatever it was. <laughs> but Putin would love to be part of our coalition if you cut him in in a little piece. Let the Russians have some say in what happens with Iraqi oil. Let the Russians have some say in the geopolitics of the area. And what we should do now is not just take all the troops out of Iraq. Boom. I think that would be a mistake. And five years from now, we'd have worse terrorism here in America if we did it. But rather, create the international coalition. Bring other countries in. Yes, that means we're not going to control it ourselves. Fine. That's how it ought to be in the post-9-11 era. And we could then change this fight from the fight that Tom Friedman writes about in the New York Times, which is the freedom nation, freedom nation, freedom loving nations in parts of the world against the terrorists, and that's what it should be, and if we had it multilateral, we could, as opposed to what it is now, which is the US versus Islam, which is a loser for us. And you'd bring in the Turks and the Pakistanis and the Indonesians. And so what I think would, the only way we're going to solve this problem is by going back to the UN or doing what Harry Truman did. That's a, Harry Truman is a good way to look at this because that was the last time the big tectonic plates of foreign policy moved. 1946, we had just beat the Germans and Japanese. The average American's view was, the heck with the rest of the world. Let's in, work hard here at home and enjoy the fruits of our labors. And then you see this big Russian monolith and Truman didn't know what to do, and he made mistakes, and he paid a political price for it. But his bit of wisdom is he created an international structure, Marshall Plan, NATO, CEDO, CENTO, which served us well over the next 40 years. And so what I would do, Dan, and what I think we ought to be doing, is saying we have to bring the other nations into the world. We have to make this uh, into Iraq, the other nation in the world into Iraq. We have to make this multilateral, whether through the UN, which I think we could succeed at doing. We could isolate the French, who I think just want to put a finger in our eye, but we could get the Russians on board. The Germans will be happy to be part of it if they don't have to send any troops, but they would be happy to be part of the rebuilding and the funding. And we could make this happen. And we could make it happen in a decent way and maybe create a, the first democratic country in the Arab world, which I think is a worthy goal. I don't think it's a reason to have a war, but I think it's a worthy goal. Let's hear it for Chuck. Great. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Dan.